this Palm Sunday as we prepare to enter this week we call Passion Week where you walk the earth for your last day, Father. Lord, we remember all that you've done. We remember your legacy. We remember your humility. How you came into this world so quietly yet, Lord, you left with such a bang. Lord, we thank you for the impact that you've had not just then, but today, Lord, that your word, your spirit is alive and well. And Lord, we can live in your glory. Lord, this morning, we just ask, Lord, that you open our hearts to more, more of who you are, more of your heart for ourselves, for this world. Lord, that you teach us to love the way that you've loved. Lord, that we honor your glory and your legacy. Thank you, Lord, that all for all that you are, for letting us dwell in this glory. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't he good? Yeah. Amen. Gaily, go ahead and pray over the people. There you go. This morning I saw... You can be seated. ...and worship. The ground was just covered in, like, Van Gogh. Van Gogh did a starry night. He could see things that other people couldn't see. And I just heard the Lord say, I'm healing my people this morning. So if there's, you have some, if somebody in the house, you need healing, raise your hand right now real fast. I see it. Look, somebody with sickle cell. I don't know what that is, but I heard that word. Ha. Ah. So Lord, we just release healing. If you see somebody with their hand up, just put your hand on, on them. There we go. Lord, we just release your healing power in this house. You said you're healing your people. Jesus, that's why you came. One of the elements of why you came was to heal your people, God. So we release that this morning. Yes. Any and all disease has to leave now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? 
Yeah. He is so good. Well, let's start with introductions. My name is Pastor Jeff. And My name is Gailey, and I lead our women's group on Tuesday nights. Amen. We have a couple of announcements, and we're so excited about this week. We're excited and we're expectant because this is called Holy Week, and we got a couple of announcements. The first one is don't be here Tuesday night. We're not having Jesus night. Amen. So if you come here Tuesday night, I might be here. I'll pray for you as you go home because we have something very special this Friday. Yes, we are excited about, as it is Holy Week, today is Palm Sunday, Friday is Good Friday service, and we are so excited to just go through this whole week, like really focusing on God, what Jesus did for us, today he wrote in, and then Friday, Good Friday came, when we remember, when we stop as a family, we want to invite you in at 630, have communion have community, yes. have fellowship, yes. and remember, and even celebration. So we want you guys to invite, come, invite a friend, because we just really sense that God is doing something he is. He is. amazing in this, in this hour, in this church, in our city, guys. So we just bless that. Yeah, and this all includes you and your family. So Friday at 6.30, it's going to be a time of family. It's going to be a time of worship. It's going to be a time of communion. And, of course, we're going to be praying because we have Jesus as the center of our lives. Amen. Now, on March 31st, everyone knows that is Easter. Amen? And it's a perfect time to keep our eyes on Jesus. But we don't want to go by ourselves. So what we've done as a church family, we have three services. We have one at 8 a.m., 9.45 and 11.30. But what we want to do is invite you to invite someone that is in your circle. God is going to highlight them. Maybe they're going to be in line at Starbucks. Maybe it's the person that cuts you off on 78. I don't know. <laughs> Find a time maybe to tell them to come here on March 31st because we as a family are going to serve. We're going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we give them all glory. Yes. So remember... 8 a.m., 945 and 1130. Amen. Now, right now, we want to extend our worship with tithes and offerings because generosity is our honor. For those who are partnering with us, we're so grateful because we see the fruit of our giving. Amen. Yes. We're going to put a couple of... Um, uh, there you go, right there. I can never remember that. I don't know what it is, but some <laughs> options right there. You can text your, you can text your gift, and we're gonna have the ushers come forward. And maybe you're a little old school like me, and you like to write a check. We're gonna give you a space to do that. So let's take a moment as they come forward to give our offerings unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It's always good to give unto the Lord. I'm going to just uh, do, just pray over the offering. Amen. Father, we thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provision. And we thank you that you've blessed this giving right now. And we honor you as you honor us in our obedience. We give you glory. We give you honor as you supply over and over again. And everyone said, if you could do me a favor, if you could stand to your feet. And give honor to the man of God, Pastor Patrick Lynch. Amen. Oh, okay. Come on, movement family. Turn to somebody this morning and say welcome. Turn to somebody this morning and say welcome to the house of God. Welcome to the house of God. Welcome to the house of God. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. I'm going to dangerously move this table. Hey, listen, last week, uh, I had a message. I talked about the one. I talked about who's the one. You know, Jesus had the one. Jesus had you in mind. Jesus had me in mind. And when 
he has you in mind and he goes after you as the one you then become part of the 99. You can, you can catch this message on our YouTube to get the whole thing. But the essence of what we were talking about was is that there are people in your close vicinity. There are people close to you today. They're not far off. There are people right around you that are desperate for a touch of Jesus. They're desperate to know Jesus. And my question to you last week was, who's who's the one? And so uh, what we want to do is we want to pray for your one. We take this really serious. We want to be able to not just talk about it, but throughout the week, we have a team that intercedes. We have people all week praying. We have people showing up Sunday morning for anyone's in the building, praying, people praying right now while we're in this room, praying right now for this moment. So this is really important. We want to be able to pray for your one. And we're going to, we're going to pray for all of the ones uh, on Friday at our Good Friday service. And so this is really important. If you could do this, take your phone out. If you're, if you're tech savvy, if you're digitally native, take your phone out. You're going to, I'm getting you prepped to scan a QR code. Okay. So open your camera app and I want you to scan this. We're going to take a second and just do this. Scan this QR code, and here's what it's going to do. It's going to take you to a page where you're simply going to put your first and last name, and you're just going to put the first name of your one. This is important. You're going to put the first name of your one. Last week we said, let's pray. God, just show us who the one is. Break our heart for the one. So real quickly, we're just going to do, as a family, we're just going to do this, just Put your first and last name and put the name of your one. And here's what I want you to know we're committed to. We're committed to praying for that one until we hear the story of that one giving their lives to Jesus and going public with their faith and being baptized. We are committed to praying for that one, no matter how long it takes, because we want to love them. We want to show care. We want to come alongside. This is not a solo act. This is not something you do on your own. This is something that we are doing as a family. And so it's very simple. Does everyone, everyone got it? Everyone got the one? Okay. This week, you know, uh, we, we enter into uh, the one, Jesus, it's really about him. We say at the movement, Jesus is the center. Why? Because he is the one. He is the one thing. And this week we're celebrating Holy Week or sometimes we call Passion Week. And what's fascinating is there's this moment that happens that we typically celebrate today on Palm Sunday. It's, this is the moment that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, okay? And we're going to read this scripture in a second, but I want us to understand the power and the importance of this week. Greater than 25% of every gospel written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, greater than 25% of each gospel written is dedicated and given to one week of his life. This week. 25% minimum. The book of John, we're going to read here in a second, John chapter 12, 50% of the book, 50% of what John writes about happens in the last week of Jesus' life. There's something powerful about this one week. And what I want to do is I want us to grab a hold of some things about this week, but I'm also, I want us to grab a hold of some postures that we can take personally. So uh, in the book of John chapter 12, I'm going to Read in verse 12. This is the moment that Jesus rides into town. It says, The next day when the large crowd who had come to the Passover feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees in homage to him as king. And they went out to meet him. And they began shouting and kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed, celebrated, praise. It's the song, it's, it's what Angela and the team was just, they were just leading, Hosanna, Hosanna. Okay, this is like blessed, celebrated, great, praised are you. You're the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it just as it is written in scripture. 
Do not fear, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Today is Palm Sunday. Jesus is riding into town on his way to pouring himself out to the point of death on the cross. And he rides in humbly on a donkey when typically kings, they're saying, here's the king. Typically kings would ride into town in a chariot because they're getting ready to go to war. Jesus rides in on a donkey humbly because he's ready to bring peace. And here's this powerful moment that I think speaks to where we're at today. And what I would present to you is I think today in society, socially and personally, we are in the deepest, most desperate need for the person of peace. Your heart, our society is in deep need for peace. Not in deep need for, we, we don't need kings riding into town going to war. We need kings and leaders riding into town to bring peace. This is what Palm Sunday is about. He's getting ready to bring a peace that, when you read through scripture, it says a peace beyond our understanding. It's not a peace like, oh, just make everything calm. It's, it's a peace that you're like, I don't understand it. In the middle of lack of calm, my heart is stayed on him. My, my, my heart is not thrown about, even though the wind is throwing culture about. He's getting ready to pour himself out. Here's the problem. You and I can want Jesus to pour out his peace in our life while at the same time, we're not ready to receive what he's pouring out. God, I want you to put, like you may be sitting here today, God, yes, pour out your peace in my relationships, in my family, in my parenting, in me, in, in, in my finances, in my education. You, you, God, but are we, re, are, do we have a posture, are we positioned ready to receive what Jesus just rode into town ready to pour out? Today, we're gonna talk about how to receive the fullness of peace that Jesus is ready to pour out in our lives. The name of my message is today, uh, Living on Empty living on empty. Uh, would you close your eyes and pray with me this morning? Jesus, we, we, we're just right off the bat, God, <laughs> I'm gonna give honor to your son. Jesus, we give honor to you this morning. Humbly, we come before you and we give honor to you that today that something would transpire in this place, something would transpire in your house, something would transpire in our hearts when we would grab a hold of the ultimate hack, the ultimate posture, the ultimate positioning for us to fully receive everything that it is that you died for and that you want us to have. God, where the enemy wants us to hold on to things and fall short, God, you are a God of fullness. You're not a God of half. You gave it all, and God, we want to receive it all. So we ask for a heart this morning, postured, positioned, and ready to receive. And if you're ready to receive this morning, say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, how thank you this morning. Listen, we, we try and keep full what God wants to fill. Oftentimes, we try and keep full what God wants to fill. The day before uh, Jesus rides into town, one of the things that I want to do is I, 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 I want to take us back a little bit. There's a moment that we're celebrating today, Palm Sunday. Jesus rides into town. But what happened just before that is going to give us some insight. Jesus uh, humbly rides into town triumphantly, they say. It's the triumphant entrance because he's about to overcome death. That's what he's triumph over. And in verse one, I just read verse 12 when he rides in town, but let's go all the way back to chapter 12, verse one. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus went to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom he had raised from the dead. So they gave a supper to him there. 
Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. I just, I want to stop for a second. I just, I, I, I want to paint this picture for you. Jesus goes, and, there, and there's a famous historical account of uh, Martha and Mary and the friend, his friends. He had these close friends. One of them was this guy, Lazarus. And they come to Jesus, like, Jesus, Lazarus is dying. He's like, you got to come. And he's like, uh-huh, gotcha. <laughs> we need you to ride into town triumphantly over Lazarus' death. And Jesus like, got you. Lazarus dies. On the third day of being dead, Jesus shows up, says, Lazarus, come on out here, bro. And stinky dead, three-day dead Lazarus walks out alive. It, it is a prophetic foretelling of what Jesus is going to do. He's gonna show up right in triumphantly. He's gonna call things that, that are dead, stinky dead, dead, dead. He's gonna call those things that are dead to life. And he's gonna say, broken relationship, come forth. Broken marriage, come forth. Broken family, generational family stuff, come forth. Broken molecular cells, sickness, come forth. Broken addictive patterns, come forth. Those things that we think that are dead, dead, he says, come alive. Lazarus is this beautiful representation to us on what happens when we're positioned and postured. And there's Jesus sitting, he, he, he calls Lazarus forth. He gets away, spends some time alone, which he often did. Solitude, not isolation. Whole nother message. And then he comes back to Bethany, verse one. And he sits and they're like, hey, bro, let's have dinner. He's like, yeah, because Passover's about ready to happen. Okay. Verse three, then Mary, because Mary's there, Martha and Mary, if you've ever heard any you know, stories in the Bible about these two, it's really funny because they're like, polar opposites. Then Mary took a pound of very expensive perfume of pure nard and she did what? Poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. This is what we have to know that what, what Mary just did, this, it's called spike nard. It's an oil that actually was brought from India. It was very expensive. Typically people would carry around like a small vial, like maybe a pint, like just very not, not, not that much, an ounce, I'm sorry. Just it, it, like not, they wouldn't carry that much. What she had was worth a year's wages, which means she wasn't carrying an ounce. She was carrying like, And it had this sweet smell and she pours it out. And this is what I love about what Mary begins to tell us about positioning and posturing ourselves to receive. Mary refuses to offer Jesus something that didn't cost her anything. Let me say that again. God refused to offer us something, salvation, that didn't require sacrifice. It costs something. We like to preach like this free, the free gospel. There's, can I just, can I just I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break some American, poor American church talk, okay? We're gonna break it right now. I want you to know something. The freedom and the peace, the joy of your salvation was not free. It required sacrifice. In fact, what it required was an all-in sacrifice. So Mary is like, I refuse to offer something, bring an offering that doesn't cost me something. And I love this. This is what David in the Bible, who's known as a man after God's heart, he, he, this is what he says, 2 Samuel 24, 24. But the king, David, said to Arina, no, 
but I will certainly buy it from you for a price. David's trying to, he's trying to, 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 to bring an offering, a sacrifice, and he needs this threshing floor. And, the ki- and, and th- this guy that he's talking to is like, here, you can just have it. He's like, no, my offering should cost me something. So this is what he goes. He goes, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David purchased the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Mary, like David, was showing us that there is a cost to following Jesus. There is a cost to us following Jesus. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, disciples, little followers, little learners, little students, my goal that our entire goal in existence is to help you as a follower, learner, that your growth is our goal. We want you to understand what following Jesus looks like. It's not a self-help or a uh, 14 steps to a beautiful me type of thing. It's what does it look like for me to be a student and a learner and a follower, really a follower of Jesus. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. Therefore, if you said yes to Jesus, this is you. And uh, we can relate this in 2024. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your Take up your cross and do what? Follow me. Cross, symbol of death. Cross is a symbol of death. Uh, Dying to yourself. It doesn't mean like Jesus died physically. It doesn't mean that you and I have to go to the cross physically, but it is a spiritual account of us saying, you know what? I'm gonna have to really die to myself. Die to the things that I want. Die to my ideas. My ideology, my ideas, how I think the world should operate is not actually going to determine what God has set into motion on how things should operate. This is important for us. It's going to cost us. Take up your cross. This is what it means. Pour yourself out. What does Mary do? She's pouring herself out. She's giving us this beautiful picture of a posture and a position to say, I'm going to pour myself out. I'm going to take up what she doesn't know yet. I, I'm, I'm helping us. She's helping us see what it looks like to take up our cross, to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is gonna cost rather than be convenient. We love convenient faith. <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's kinda, it's kinda gray outside. Bless you if you're watching from home right now. Because the weather was just too much for you. You know, I just, I wish the chairs were a little softer. You know, I wish all of these things that we get picky about are convenience. (laughs) You know, marriage is a cost. It's not convenient. My, my, my wife, Shandra, and I just on Friday just celebrated 27 years of being married. 30. You should high five her. That was a lot of work for her. Listen, uh, 33 years together, I'm going to tell you something. When you stand, when you make the vow, it is not for convenience. I just want you to know something. Say, if you're single, I just want you to know something. That thing that you're longing for is going to cost you more than you've ever imagined. Because because the relationship with Jesus in Scripture is also likened to marriage, and this is why. Because the moment that I stood at an altar and I vowed to my wife, Chandra, there was a cost. This was the cost. It's 100% all in all the time. It's not, it's not a 50-50 relationship. It's 100-100, and, he, and, and I'm gonna go even deeper. It's 100% pour yourself out even when the other person is operating at 10%. 
It's not predicated on what they're doing. It's predicated on the vow of the relationship. And it has to do with there being a cost. It's not convenient. And too often in society today, why is divorce so rampant? Because we've made marriage about convenience and it's contractual and it's covenant and there's a cost. Marriage Counseling 101. Faith in Jesus Counseling 101. Is my complaint about my faith because of the convenience that I'm feeling pressure in? It's not convenient. I will tell you that we have failed to make it clear in American church. We have failed as a leader to make it clear the cost, the true cost of following Jesus. We've made it about hey, this is free for you, it's all about you, God died for you and you alone and you and you and you and just everyone close your eyes and hey, if you, wanna, if you want Jesus who made it about you to meet you just in the quiet of your anonymity right now, no one's looking, just raise your hand because it's just between God and you. And I, I'm sorry for that as a leader in American church. I'm sorry that we are not letting you know as followers of Jesus, as disciples, as sheep to the shepherd, I apologize that we're not truly telling you the truth and saying there is a cost, it's not convenient, it means you have to lay everything down. Not some things down, it's lay what down? Lay everything down. You must give up your own way is what Jesus says. Too often what we're told is take your wealth to the street. And Mary takes her wealth to Jesus' feet. That's why we love social media. It's the beauty posts. Man, it's just, we, we want to show all the wealthy parts of our life. We're afraid, we're afraid of the vulnerability to show the, the hard parts, the parts that cost. Like, I'm, I'm just going to start, put, like, follow me on social media. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to show you the hardest parts of my day, the parts that are just, they're gifts, they're sacrifices, they're costs. I, I guarantee you, people are going to be like, this is a, I don't want, I don't want to look at this. But it actually is what's going to relate to you the most. Our faith is about taking what, what we have, wealth, it's not, wealth is not money, by the way. Uh, wealth, the abundance of what we've tried to do on our own. And, it, and we say, take it to, post about it, talk about it, make it public, let everyone see it the, 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 on the designer or the emblem on the car or whatever it is. Now, I'm, not, I'm not hating on things, but what it is, is it, it, it's, it's a heart condition, God is after the sacrifice attached to the cost because it keeps the heart humble. Uh, you know, typically when in a, in a good Jewish household, when you walked into the house, a guest would walk in, in this case it was Jesus, Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Simon, Simon is, is whose house they were at, Simon was a leper. Um, Jesus was hanging out with all the dudes. Okay, and there was, there was typically this moment that the host in the house would greet the guest and would put a little bit of oil on their, on their forehead and, and anoint them like, bless you, and have water for their feet. But Mary anointed Jesus' head with honor and his feet with humility. At the core of what we're talking about is it's honor and humility at the same time. She poured it out on Jesus' feet and wiped it with her hair. In most cases, this task was reserved for a, a lowly servant. Jesus walks into the house, and this is what it says in the book of Mark, this same account of, of the same moment. Mark says in chapter 14, verse 3, while he was in Bethany, Jesus, as a guest at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, a woman, Mary, a woman came with an alabaster vial, a very costly and precious perfume, a pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured the perfume over his 
head. So we get, when you, when you put this together, we have this account where she pours it over his head, but really finds herself at his feet. What begins at honor ultimately has to end in humility. It says she poured, it means to anoint. To, when people were anointed in this context, it's good for us to understand, you know, uh, maybe, you know, we go, oh, you're anointed, you know, get a little bit of oil on your finger and touch to someone's forehead. I want you to know what anointing was scripturally. Anointing was you have a ram's horn, pretty big horn, full of oil that had been, this oil had been crushed from olives, And in the crushing produced this oil. And they would take and dump the entire thing on top of someone's head. And this oil would run down head to toe. They would be saturated. Can I tell you that anointing that she brings, Mary's bringing, every anointing comes with a crushing God, I want you to, hey, Jesus, you died for me. God, would you just anoint my life? Just answer. And, and I, I have to tell you that anointing comes from crushing. The greater the breaking, the greater the crushing, the greater the anointing. She poured it all out. She poured out all of her honor, humility, and devotion on Jesus' feet at a sacrificial cost. It was an act of worship. Worship is the pouring out of honor, humility, and devotion on Jesus' feet at a sacrificial cost. Let me say that again. Worship is the pouring out of honor, humility, and devotion on Jesus' feet at a sacrificial cost. Worship is what you offer to God with a sacrificial cost. Uh, I just want to like demystify something. Worship is not standing in a room on a Sunday morning and raising your hands. I, I just I'm going to be on, I'm going to be really honest with you. I love I, I okay I'm picking a little bit on American culture. I listen. I love our culture. I I love what we do. I love what we do. But th this is this is not sac. No sacrifice involved. There's no cost to this. Take me to a country where me raising my hands to God gets my head cut off. I'm just being real. That's sacrificial. In America, I'm just being honest with you. Guys, it's not a sacrifice to show up on a Sunday morning and raise your hands and go, hmm. It's not, it's not sacrificial. There is a cost. Don't get me wrong. There is a cost. If you've got kids, trust me. <laughs> I got kids. I'm with you. You're like, <laughs> you must not have any like toddlers. <laughs> like, listen, there's a cost, but is it sacrificial? The greater the sacrifice, this is why it's important. The greater the sacrifice, the emptier the vessel and the more available space there is for God to fill. God, I want you to pour yourself out, but I'm too busy trying to make myself full, and I'm occupying the space that you want to fill. Are you with me? The goal is to be as empty as possible for God to fill beyond our understanding. That's the goal. In verse three, and she poured it out on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and then listen to this, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Our aim, our aim is to always fill this house. Our aim at Movement Church is to always fill this house with the fragrance of our worship 
as we pour ourselves out. He can only fill what's empty. My question is, are you offering all of yourself to Jesus at a cost or is it convenient? What seems like a waste is our only way forward. What seems like a waste is our only way forward. Here's... Here's what I think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with this. And this is a couple of things that I think get in our way of positioning ourselves and posturing ourselves in a way ready to receive what Jesus wants to pour out. Okay. And the very next verse says that her fragrance fills the house. And in verse 4, look who comes onto the scene. But Judas Iscariot. Okay, listen. Judas. Does, is anyone familiar with Judas? All right, Judas is going to go on to portray Jesus and turn him over uh, and, and kind of kickstarts this whole part of Jesus going to the cross and his death. It says, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was going to betray him, said, he says this to Mary, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Now he said this, not because he cared about the poor, for he had never cared about them, but because he was a thief. And since he had the money box serving as treasure for the 12 disciples, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Like, catch this. He was like the church treasurer. And he's like, Mary, (laughs) ha ha. You're an idiot. You should be selling this for all the money it's worth so we can take care of the poor. Mary, your worship is a waste and makes no sense. The word that I would use is it was extravagant. You know what extravagant means? It means beyond reason. (laughs) Like beyond what would be expected, beyond what would make sense. Like, God didn't just fix the problem. He sent his son to die, to eradicate death. He went, that was extravagant. He didn't just, oh, it's expected. He just, you know, he come in and fix this thing. God doesn't want to restore things to just, ah, this is where it was. He's going to restore it to what? Better. Why? He's an extravagant God. God, I didn't expect that because that's God. Mary is shockingly extravagant by pouring out all of her costly oil. Uh, and this is in the book of Mark again. This is the same account. It says, but the, there were some who were indignantly remarking to one another. Just so you know, like in the book of John, they talk about Judas, but there is clearly a bunch of people that are followers of Jesus. Can I just stop for a second and tell you that oftentimes it's people inside the house that want to tell you your worship is a waste. So just a just side note, Christians, followers of Jesus in the room, can we stop can we, stop, can we stop pointing fingers at each other and saying, you know, that's just stupid. That doesn't make sense. That worship seems wasteful. You should be selling that stuff and doing this over here. Could we, like the biggest problem isn't from, the, the world actually is looking at us, the world, everyone outside of faith is looking at the church and going, we expect you to be extravagant. And here we have, we have disciples, followers of Jesus that are coming down on Mary. You're a waste, Mary. <laughs> Why has the perfume been what? Wasted. For this perfume might have been sold for more than 300 denarii, laborers' wages for almost a year, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. She's being scolded for being extravagant rather than doing what's expected. Can I, can I just say to you, expected... Expected is checking the religious box. Well, you know, I just, I, 
what do they want from me? I showed up and I sat in a seat. This is what we do in America. Guys, I'm just, I'm pick, okay? Can everyone real quick, on three, I want you to smile. One, two, three, smile. It releases endorphins. Come on, we need to smile, man. Like, I just, I'm a truth teller. I can't, I, I can't get her, like, people are like, you people would probably like you more if you didn't tell the truth. I'm like, bah! okay. It gets me in trouble a lot. But this is, the, this is what God's convicting me of. Pat, are you showing, are you showing up? Okay, look, I'm going to make it personal. <clears throat> I'm going to throw myself under the bus. Pat, are you showing up and doing what's expected as a leader of my house? Or are you showing up as a leader willing to extravagantly pour yourself out? Are, 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 are you showing up because, well, I'm, I'm, I'm checking the pastor box. Like, I, 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 you know. God, you know, I was like, I put. Yeah, so. I, mm, I just so much that I'm just. Expected is checking the religious box by doing the bare minimum. Uh, just historically, just for all of us to know historically, when people of God, followers, specifically the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, did the bare minimum and checked the box, God literally told them, stop showing up with your worship. Old Testament. They were showing up, doing the sacrifice. They were like, doot, doot, we're robots. Doot, 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 doot. We're doing the thing. <laughs> but their hearts were disconnected, and they're doing the thing. And God literally said to them, stop bringing, stop bringing your offering. Why? Because they appear to be sacrificed on the surface, but it's costing their heart nothing because they were so disconnected. Because they were doing what was expected. And God literally said, stop bringing it. And he quit talking to the nation of Israel. True story. He be, you know the first time he began speaking again prophetically to his people? Was through John the Baptist's father. When he began to prophesy after his son was born. There's a massive gap there. God values extravagant rather than expected. Number one, one of the number one things that stops us from being postured in position to receive things, we just think, we're, we, well, I'm doing the religious minimum. I'm doing what's expected. It's a roadblock for us, okay? And then Judas goes on, he, you know, he focuses on the value of the anointing oil, um, the value to him, rather than the value of who the oil was anointing. Let me say that again. Judas focuses on the value of the anointing oil to him personally rather than the value of the one the oil was anointing, Jesus. He loses sight of Jesus and he puts himself in a position of value. Uh, his name, by the way, Judas's name, means he will be praised. And he, that's not Jesus, it's himself. Judas's name means he will be praised. Judas will. Judas's Literally, his life is, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that I'm praised, that I'm celebrated, that I get what I want, that I'm served. Mary's pouring out is a give. Mary is pouring, Judas is pilfering. Mary's pour is a give, his pilfering is a take. Take is entitlement. Take is entitlement. This is what Judas is thinking. Jesus owes me something for being his friend. In 
entitlement. I deserve to be praised and celebrated. Judas was entitled. Mary was extravagant. Her oil, Mary, her oil was for her master rather than for the gain of money. What I know here is that Judas, whatever money would have been raised from selling that oil to put into the treasury box, guess what it would have done for him? It would have increased his take. The two things that are at war against us being postured in position, ready to receive what Jesus has to pour out in your life, in my life, in this house, is doing what's expected and entitlement. Mary gives us this beautiful example of to kill those things, to kill kind of this, we're checking the box, to kill entitlement is moving extravagance. When I don't feel like bringing all of myself, it actually, the best, my, my best response is to bring all of myself. When I don't feel like showing up and serving because I'm thinking about myself, I've just learned this in the last 24 years, by the way. Uh, take it for what you will. When I'm feeling depressed, thinking about myself, and what do I, the best thing that I can do is show up and pour myself out for other people. The best thing I can do is pour myself out at Jesus' feet. My best response isn't to sit back and go, gosh, you know, I'm really bummed about this. I deserve more from the church. I deserve more from my wife. I deserve more from my employer. I deserve more from my country. I gotta be honest with you. Mary gives us this beautiful example of this fact. I don't deserve anything. I, don't, I do not deserve, I, I am fallible. I fail, I'm imperfect, I'm a broken person. I don't actually deserve what Jesus has given me. I don't deserve him pouring himself out to the point of death on the cross. I don't deserve it. And it's a heart of gratitude that I'm able to like Mary go, you know what God, I'm gonna pour my entire life. My praise is in my pouring. My praise is in my pouring. Would you stand with me this morning? So Jesus said, Jesus is sitting there this whole time this is happening, and this is what Jesus says to all these fools. Uh, he says, let her alone. Jesus literally goes, leave her alone, back off, so that she may keep the rest of it for the day of my burial. Here's what it is. Hey, when you feel like, yeah, this is a little too much, I'm wasting myself, I'm wasting my worship on Jesus, I should back off. Jesus is saying, no, you should lean in. You should keep pouring, keep bringing, keep giving. Why? Because the goal is to be as empty as possible. Jesus puts a priority on pouring yourself out on him, what? First. Jesus loves the poor. Can I just, I'm just gonna say this really quickly in case you're thinking about it. Jesus loves the poor. But too often, we'll pour ourselves out on the poor without pouring ourselves out on Jesus' feet first. And the most powerful thing we can do as a church, as his house, as a family, is pour ourselves out on him. And out of that place, we will be able to pour ourselves out on the feet of those who need him to a greater degree. Our worship should seem like a waste to a Judas world. Movement Church, I can't speak for anyone else. Our worship here should seem like a waste to a Judas world. What stops us from pouring ourselves out in extravagance at Jesus' feet? Doing what's expected or being entitled? If you feel comfortable doing so, let's close our eyes. Jesus is triumphantly running, riding into our lives. Jesus is triumphantly riding into town. He's riding into circumstances. He's riding into our hearts. He's riding into our lives. Are we postured to receive what he wants to pour out? He's looking for those who are living on empty from pouring themselves out at his feet. Here's some questions for us today. How is my life currently being poured out as a fragrance to fill God's house? How is my life today, March 24th, 
currently being poured out as a fragrance to fill God's house. Let me ask this question, what would happen if we all came to the house willing to waste ourselves on Jesus? Think about this, what would happen if we all came to this house ready and willing to waste ourselves on Jesus, to pour ourselves out in a makes no sense way? Am I willing to empty myself out on the feet of Jesus? three questions we're going to end with. Does how I give my life to God make sense? I'm doing what's expected. Does how I give my life to God make a demand? Is it entitled? Does how I give my life to God make no sense? Is it extravagant? Father, today, we celebrate the fact that you're riding in triumphantly into town. And there are things that you wanna ride in triumphantly into that are going on in our world, in our state, in our country, in our cities, in our homes, in our lives, in our relationships, in our bank accounts. There are things that you wanna show up in and you are asking us if we're willing to empty ourselves out at your feet so you can fill empty vessels with what you have. You're pouring yourself out. You're in the business of it. Are we postured and ready to receive it? Are we postured and ready to receive it? Lord, posture us, position us as a family, as a church, as a people to pour ourselves out. Humility, honor, and devotion. Humility, honor, and devotion. This is what we're celebrating. In Jesus' powerful name, everyone said. Amen and amen.